you know, uh, church, it's great to have you here. If you're a guest, especially, uh, we are excited to have you. I pray that you stick around and get a chance to meet um, uh, one another. We, we are a church that uh, believes strongly in fellowship, so sometimes we can, you know, talk a little, you know, it's hard to kind of rally and pull us back together because we talk so much. But it's great to be able to be here. Let's go to our Father in prayer. We have a great Bible study for us um, this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we pray and worship you, we thank you. And Father, we, our hearts are filled with joy just to see our sister just totally just celebrate. And uh, because her sins have been forgiven and she's given her life to you. So we rejoice with her. We rejoice with you in heaven. And I pray now, Father, as we open up the scriptures and read scripture, I pray that it, 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 we won't take it for granted or take it lightly what, what we're about ready to do. We're about ready to open up and read the Word of God. And I pray that you will meet us um, right when we read these scriptures and touch us and encourage us. Father, convict us. But Father, you know our needs. And I pray in a supernatural way, you, you will get the crevices of our consciences and hearts and minister to us this morning. Father, remove me on the way. Uh, it's not about me. Father, we know it's about you. So meet our needs this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, we are in a, a sermon series. It's actually entitled Rebuild. And uh, we've been having a great time just talking about the church. Today we're going to talk about kind of our, our church in general. And the, the vision of what we're trying to do, even with this topic of rebuild. Uh, God, God is doing some things. Sometimes you have to just sit back and go, okay, um, let, let's, let's, let's think about remodeling and rebuilding and renewing um, uh, the, the church as a whole. I, I love this topic. Uh, as a matter of fact, yesterday I was over visiting one of our friends, our, our brother Mark and Mary Klein. I was at their house down in Southern Maryland and, and they did some renovation and I was like amazed by their rebuilding. Um, they had a, a section of their home. It was beautiful. You know, every time something is, uh, is finished and is completed, it, it's just a, a glory that results from that. There's a joy that comes from rebuilding. And, uh, and that includes the church itself. As we rebuild the church, there, there's a joy that we have. Uh, the church is actually the building that we're trying to build. Now, we've been studying the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, this, this is the Old Testament. This is about uh, maybe approximately 500 years before the New Testament began, or that the Jesus came on earth. And what Israel was doing was they were trying to reestablish the temple that was destroyed by an invading country of ba uh, the Babylon. Uh, ba uh, the, the Babylon nation came in and destroyed Jerusalem. They, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the walls, and God allowed it in his sovereignty for his people to come out of exile and start a rebuilding project. And one of the things that they did was they rebuilt the temple first, then they rebuilt the walls that surrounded and protected Jerusalem, and now it's time to celebrate and to maintain the new nation that was created. God, God he hit the restart button on Israel. He punished them for some of the sins that they did, but now it was time for them to evaluate where they were and to recommit to being a spiritual house. A spiritual house. They completed the physical work on the temple and the walls. Now it was time for them to reform their hearts and become spiritual. There are so many different parallels that we have drawn, we've drawn from reading Ezra and Nehemiah for our church today. And really one of our goals as a congregation is to be that spiritual house. If we have a vision, I would say that will be our vision. We want to be a spiritual church. You know, this, the city is filled with a lot of churches, but we want to be a spiritual house. You know, one of the scriptures I want to study here this morning, I have really two uh, passages of scripture we're going to take a look at. The first is in 1 Peter. So if you have your Bible, should be turning over there. We're going to stay here just for a little bit. This is Peter, and Peter knew all about rebuilding. Jesus came to him and asked him a question one day. He said to his disciples, who do, who do people say I am? And they replied, many people think that you're a prophet or a spiritual person. But, but then Jesus asked them, uh, 
an incredible, penetrating question. He says, well, well okay, well, what about you? I, I know what people are saying about me, but what about you? And Peter interrupted uh, Jesus right away. He says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. And then Jesus turned to Peter and, and he responded and said, you know what, you're right. This was revealed to you, uh, not by man, but my Father in heaven. And then he told Peter something really incredible. He says, upon uh, that rock, upon that statement of faith, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. And from then on, the church of Jesus Christ was being built by Jesus. And it was not going to be a, a, a physical edifice, but it was going to be a spiritual house. And Peter was the one that Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. You're going to have a, a role in building this spiritual house. And then he said, listen, and actually the first person that ever preached their first sermon, post-resurrection, post-ascension of Jesus Christ, was Peter. And he preached on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 people were added to that spiritual house on day one of the church. So this same Peter is now reflecting upon what God has been doing in his life. He's looking at the landscape where the churches were, and, and he's encouraging them, he's commissioning them to continue this rebuild project, to continue to rebuild. So as we land in, 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 in 1 Peter, we pick up in chapter 2, and the scripture says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter said, listen, you are that spiritual house. And if he was addressing us today, he would say, you know what, we've been talking about building up the temple and building up the walls. Peter would address us and say, he would address us today and say, you are that spiritual house. I've been talking about D.C. Regional all along. You are that spiritual house. You know, the church is not a building. It's people. It's relationships. It's people who have been caught out of darkness. We'll, we'll, we'll take the that scripture here in a minute. But it's, just, but it's a spiritual edifice. Living stones. Now, when they rebuilt the temple, they actually had to carve out real stones, sometimes marble. And, 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 but those stones weren't alive. When they, built, when they rebuilt the walls surrounding Jerusalem, they had to chisel out and, and go to the quarry and, 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 and get large stones to build the walls. But those stones weren't alive. But we, in the church that Jesus came to establish, are the living building blocks to this temple, to this wall. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual house. You are being built into that spiritual house. We go over a little bit more. He says, not only that, but he says, uh, uh, you're a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God. And we talk about uh, acceptable sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God. When they had the temple, and, and back in Jesus, uh, back in the days of old, they actually brought sacrifices to the temple to have their sins forgiven. He says, you know what? You guys are all priests. We all bring spiritual sacrifices. And hopefully, they're acceptable sacrifices to God. The spiritual house. And then he goes on and says, not only that, but you are a chosen people. You're unique. And as we drop down a little further, he says, uh, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says, you're a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God. But then he says, uh, as you come to this living stone, you need to understand that you are a chosen people, a unique people, 
a royal priesthood, God's special possession. You know, I'm not sure how you feel this morning. You know, sometimes we come in and we feel like, man, what's my purpose? Is there any meaning to my life? Is, 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 does God want to use me? And sometimes, even that, if we have a hard time trying to figure out where we are or in God's plan of our life, we can get discouraged. And the antidote to discouragement oftentimes is to renew our vision, to help us see ourselves from God's vantage point. That God wants to use us. And, and sometimes we just need to hear that we're chosen, that God wants to use you, that God wants to use me, that he wants to do something special in our life. We're chosen by God. So if you're feeling discouraged here this morning, I want to encourage you that you, you are special, God's special possession. You're chosen by God. When he's building his house, he's looking and says, I want to use you. I want to use you to build this temple. It's not that you are the building blocks, but I want to use you. You're a special possession. A chosen people. Ready to be used by God. He goes on and says, you've been called out of darkness into his wonderful light. I love this phrase because it, it just shows that, listen, at one point, we were all dead in our transgressions and sins. It says, when you used to follow the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at now work in those who are disobedient. And if you're a disciple here today, you can say all of us at one time lived among them and at one time in our life. We were separate from God. We were living in darkness. We did not know our way. We didn't even seek God. We were in rebellion to God. We were in darkness, making a mess out of our lives. Can I get a witness? Did anybody make a mess out of their lives? We were walking in darkness. Did you ever make a decision that you regret? Did you ever do something and say, I, I was so ashamed that I was at that place. That I said what I said. I wish I could take back what I said. I wish I could redo and, and rewind the table of my life and not do the thing that I am now ashamed of. I wish I didn't have that season in my life when I stood in rebellion to God, experimenting, trying, seeking, and what to what to what avail? Only to produce guilt because there's a darkness. There's a darkness. But if you are in the spiritual house of Jesus Christ, God doesn't see you like that anymore. You have been selected. You have been drafted. You have been chosen by God. And he sees you and says you are a special chosen people. I've called you out of darkness into his wonderful he says, well, one time you weren't like that, but now you are like that. He says, at one time, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. At one time, no mercy, but now you've received mercy. You know, I love that word, mercy. <laughs> sometimes we say that sometimes, right? We just, we just go, maybe as a side, we just go, mercy. <laughs> Lord, have your, Lord, have mercy. That's a short little prayer that I think we ought to be praying oftentimes. Just, just Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. 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 It's a great word. It kind of takes so much. It's, just, it's such a packed word. It's one of my favorite words. Because it's going to be one of the words that I actually confess to God as soon as I see him on Judgment Day. It's one of those words that I use in my prayer oftentimes. It's mercy. The word grace is a good word too, right? Like the word grace. But there's a difference between grace and mercy. Grace is an unmerited favor. God is giving you a gift. God is blessing you, and you don't deserve it. That's grace. Don't you like grace? Yeah. Grace is a great word. Grace is like, uh, I can't find you give me this gift. I didn't do anything for this gift. I didn't do anything for you to bless me like this. That, that's your grace. It's, I didn't work for it. I don't, I don't earn it. I, I, it's not an obligation that you have to, that you feel pressure, that you have to bless me. That's just grace. Mercy is a little bit different. Mercy is uh, the punishment that you're about ready to get, you're not going to get. Mercy is God not punishing you, and you know you deserve punishment. That's where mercy comes in. 
See, sometimes we don't understand. We want grace, but you know what? I think we also want more mercy. Depending upon where we are in our life, I'm motivated by mercy and grace. And then maybe they're the same thing. Maybe they're the same She received a gift from God. By faith, she received the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God. But she's also received mercy. See, one of the things that I don't think we understand about God is that this loving God, this God that created the world, and we know the, the most famous scripture in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, his one and only son. You know, we love that scripture. And, and sometimes we think that, well, God is just such a, he's like a big teddy bear in the sky. God is just so, he's my buddy. He's, he's my friend. God is, he's, he just makes me feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. That warm feeling I get. Because that's God. God's up in heaven just smiling. But I don't think we understand that this same loving God that loves us with a love that's infinite and our understanding that we try to wrap our arms around the love of God we our mortal minds couldn't even grasp the, the, the vastness of his love how high how wide how deep our, our minds can't even grasp how much God loves us as a matter of fact God is love at the same time that God that's full of love is a God that's full of wrath wrath Anger, vengeance. And before we, we get upset with that, we want God to be like that too. Because there's so much injustice in this world, right? And when you see something that happens, you know, man, is anybody going to get that person? It seems like they're getting away scot free. And then we go, God, to show your justice. And God is a just God. And we know intuitively when we do something wrong, there should be justice. Justice means the punishment that you knew before you actually committed a crime was already set before you. Justice. Justice. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. There should be justice. If somebody does something wrong, there's got to be a law, there's got to be a punishment to uh, satisfy justice. You ever see somebody get away? Without getting in trouble. Don't you feel upset this time? No, recently I was looking at this uh, uh, case. There's this guy out in California who actually, this is kind of sad, but he, he actually uh, molested, raped a woman behind the dumpster. She was unconscious. And the judge was lenient on this person, and this person only did three months' time. Three months. We're talking about this, and that's, that's not right. You ever feel like that? Like, that does not even right. Or something happens and somebody does something and they get smacked, they get, they get, get all scot free. Maybe the Trayvon Martin case, and it just seemed like that's not right. That they kind of shot that boy. And there's something inside that goes, hey, that's not right. Where is justice? See, let me tell you something. When it seems like somebody is getting away in the eyes of men, can, can you hear this point? They're not getting away in the eyes of a just God. My God knows what he's doing. God understands. You might not understand God's plan, but trust me, God is just, and he will uh, unleash his wrath. My Bible says that the wrath of God is being stored up. That's a scary thought, right? And then my Bible talks about Isaiah. Remember Isaiah in the Old Testament? There's a guy just transporting the ark of God. The ark
see, when we were living in darkness, we were playing Russian roulette with our lives. Because the wrath of God at any given moment in time could have broken out on our life and we would have been in trouble when and if we were in the darkness. But my Bible says you're a chosen people. You're a holy, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He says, uh, I called you out of darkness into my wonderful lights. You receive mercy. Mercy. That means the wrath of God that's being stored up and is, 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 is being almost chained up. God is, he's, because God is not, even though he's, he's, he's got these two qualities about him. He's a God of love, but he's a God of justice. He's a fair God, but he's a God of wrath. He's a loving, a compassionate, slow to anger God. At the same time, he has to be true to his character. God can't compromise his own integrity and his own truthfulness, the wrath has to be exposed and displayed on the objects of people who break God's commands. My Bible says we all have sinned. My Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. They all together have become worthless. He says, there's no one who does good. Not even one. He says, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. He says, you know what? He says, the, the, their feet are quick to shed uh, to, to sh uh, their, their feet are quick to shed uh, Their hands are quick to shed blood. This is ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace, they don't even know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. The wrath of God is being stored up. But because of his great love for us, Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, made us a lot. Mercy. Mercy. The wrath of God is passing over us. The justice of God had to punish someone. We praise God. Because the Bible says, by his wounds we are healed. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon Jesus Christ. Mercy. God is not to say, oh, never mind, I'm not going to be a just God. No, God is saying, my wrath has been unleashed. But the good news is, the wrath that you deserve was not unleashed on you. All the holy anger, because God is a holy God, all of that was inflicted upon His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ Himself willingly offered Himself to take our punishment. All we should be able to do is to fall on our knees and say, Mercy. Mercy, God. See, but when we minimize the wrath of God, we minimize the mercy of God. When we just have a God that's a teddy bear in the sky, it's not even in our heart and mind to even ask for mercy. Sometimes in our self-deception, we don't even think we, just, we should have mercy. We, we, we in our own depravity can make ourselves out to the point where we feel like we deserve mercy. But I'm here to say, we have not received mercy when we're in the darkness. But now, you have received mercy. I love that. But now, you receive mercy. 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 You know, a prayer that gets God's attention is a prayer that asks for mercy. In Luke chapter 18, there are two people praying. One person was praying a really religious prayer. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like all other people. I'm not like this tax collector over here. I'm not like this, not like this sinner over here. He said, I give. I fast. I think I got it going on. But then the other person said, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he just beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
mercy on me, a sinner. I tried to teach this concept to my sons when they were young. You know, as a father, looking at the scriptures, my Bible says, discipline your children. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> spoil the rod, or uh, spare the rod, spoil that child. My Bible says, don't be a willing party to your son or daughter's death because you don't want to uh, discipline them. I, I know I've got a sermon in me, but that's for our parenting devotional. That's going to be coming up. It's a little preview. But the point of the matter is, listen, if you're a parent, and you know, when you want to raise your children right, you're going to actually teach them this concept when they're young. That when you do something, you, there's, there's rules, and if you don't do it, listen, there's consequences to your bad decisions, and we, I have to explain that to you and hold you accountable to the, to, to the, the agreement that we have and my standard that we have. In the Reed household, listen, if, if, there, there, is, if there was this, this rebellion that was being unchecked and disobedience that, that was being just uh, 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 just uh, willfully, uh, willful obedience over time. You know, the wrath of Daryl Reed was, can, can build up. <laughs> my, my sons probably testified better than me, but hey, every once in a while, I, I would have to show them God. <laughs> Watch 
story about God. I'm not trying to negotiate with them to make them people of the world who don't even know how to face the consequences of their own bad decisions in life because they have no understanding of justice and fear. So, we, 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 the, the, the little bit of wrath can be revealed uh, on their bottoms, on their behinds. But sometimes it's mercy. You know, as a son of God, I'm like my children. Sometimes I like, I can take it for granted. Grace. Mercy, not realizing the wrath of God is being stored up. And at any given moment, ah, that wrath can break out. If you are a Christian, if you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, if you believe that Jesus was the sacrificial replacement. He took your punishment that he stepped up and says, the punishment that they deserve, I'm willing to take. If you believe that, if you trust in that, if you understand that Jesus steps up to the plate and says, listen, Father, don't spank Daryl. I'll take the licking that he deserves. If and when you get that, you love this man. See, when you understand what he did for you and I, and then you go, okay, what can I do? Well, Jesus, listen, you have to make me not just your savior, but make me your master. Make me your Lord of your life. And then what should you do? Then you need to die to that old person and give me all of your life. That's what Stephanie did. She gave Jesus her life. It's not mine. It's yours. And then she was immersed in Christ. Clothed in Christ. So when God looks at Stephanie, when he, when he looks at Tyrone over here, he's not even seeing Tyrone. He's not even seeing Stephanie. He sees Jesus Christ, who already took the punishments on that Calvary cross. By his wounds we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. In other words, mercy. Does this encourage you this morning? Because we need pray prayers are just mercy. Now, here's the thing. Our church, this is the kind of church we want to build. This, this talks of vision. We want a church that's not judgmental, not looking down on people, but basking in the mercy of God. Being motivated by His grace, we want to shout out and declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. That's why we talk about evangelism in the church. Because it's a result of mercy. It's not, oh, do you have to share your faith? Listen, I get to share my faith. You mean I can explain this to people? I can brag about how good my God is? Not to let them know that there are some answers to the deepest problems that other people have in their life. Listen, we have been, uh, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We've been called out so that we can declare. I want so bad for you to get this church. I get it. I get, and you know what the cool thing is? I've been a Christian for a long time and I'm getting it still. I've been a Christian, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I grew up in church. I grew up in church. I, I listened to more sermons. I know I've listened to more sermons than anybody in here. I, I can't tell. I've listened to 100 sermons this past week, probably. Mm -hmm. I, you know what? And I'm so excited. Like, I'm like, I'm like Stephanie. Hallelujah. I'm learning right now about this mercy about this grace. And the more I get it, the more I want to share it and talk to people about it. Now, 
you can't shut me up. I want to explain. I want to start a conversation. I want to segue and open and maneuver our talks or my introduction so I can get on this topic some way, somehow. I can't keep it in. This is too good for me. Church, I can't hold it back. I got to talk about him. I got to share about him. And I just want you to get it too. I want my church to get this. This is the vision for D.C. Regional. It's the reason why we don't share our faith. The reason why we aren't declaring his righteousness is because we don't get it. The vision for this church is how we get this. That's my vision for D.C. Regional. Now, we aren't just a religious place. That we aren't just a place for people to come and, 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 and do their penance for having a bad week. It's not even a social club where we have our friends. You know, we are a spiritual house. This is a vision for our church. We have to own this vision. Now, you might say, there was that to do with Nehemiah. I really want to quickly just share a couple of different scriptures in the book of Nehemiah, because this is where we are, chapter 10. Let me read this real quick. It says, we assume responsibility. This is after they got it. This is after they built the walls. This is towards the end of Nehemiah. Remember, the temple is shining. It's sitting there on a hill. They're offering sacrifices now. They're moving people into the city. Well, eventually they're going to be moving people into the city, but the walls have been completed. They've overcome so many obstacles. And you know what? Now it's time for them to have a collective vision. A collective vision. And then really the thing was, we have to own this vision before this new Jerusalem, this new city of God. So they sat around, they confessed, they all gave their lives to Jehovah. And now it's time for them to take a we responsibility for the, the house that was being built. And Nehemiah says over in chapter 10, verse 32, it says, We assume responsibility for carrying out the commands to, uh, to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of God, for the bread set on the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings of the Sabbath, at the new moon feast, and at the point of festivals. For the holy offerings, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and for all the duties of the house of our God. It says we. There's a lot of work that had to be going on. There's a lot of sacrifices that God was now demanding upon his people to keep uh, Jerusalem functioning as, uh, as, a, as, as a temple of God. To keep things going so that Israel can be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world that they can continue to be used by God. There, there was a lot of work that had to be done and not one person can do it. But I love how the scripture said we assume the responsibility. We assume the responsibility. You know, he said, uh, uh, as Nehemiah records this, there's a couple other times that he said this. He said it in, in uh, verse 34, as, it, as it's, uh, the scripture continues, says, we the priests and the Levites and the people have cast lots to determine when each of our families is to bring to the house of our God at set times each year a contribution of wood to burn on the altar of the Lord of our God as is written in the law. And then he goes on and says, well, once again, we also pursue responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. This is we. We're, we're, we're going to take care of the responsibility. We. It goes down to verse 36. It says, As is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, of our herds and our crocs to the house of God, to, to the priests ministering there. And then he says, Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God the priests, the first of our ground meal, our grain offerings, of the fruit of all the trees, and of our new wine, 
and olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. And then finally, he says, in verse 39, we will not neglect the house of our God. We're not going to neglect it. So where we are in our story of Nehemiah, as we come to the close of this incredible book and this sermon series, as we're approaching the end of this, there's a collective taking of responsibility for the church. Let me talk very directly to our congregation. If you're a member here, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. If you're a guest here, you can kind of go, okay, this is what you guys are doing here in the church. This doesn't necessarily apply to you. This applies to you if you say, I, 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 this is my church. This is my church family. Let me be talking very directly. If this is your church family, I'm, as, as an older brother, as a spiritual father to many, I, I want to say, our church, we need, we need to do a better job of assuming responsibility. Assuming a collective responsibility. Now, I feel responsible as a, as a minister, as our leadership group, our team, or all different leaders in the church. God, God's giving me this role at this time to be the point leader. And sometimes you just need a point guy. It doesn't make sense what the title is. You just need somebody to kind of rally everybody together and, and be the point minister. That, well, that's me. I accept that responsibility as a lead minister of this church. But knowing that that's my responsibility, I really want to encourage you that, that I want you to take some responsibility for the church too. Assume responsibility. Just don't look at the leaders and the staff and go, hey, uh, how's the church doing? Uh, what y'all doing? What's the leadership doing? What's Daryl doing? Listen, it's, it's got, somehow it's got to be this collective we take responsibility. We. There's a couple of different matters I really want to address here today. One, uh, there's, there's obviously a financial component that, that's being described right here. This is the house of God is being built, and they need to have the overall functioning of the church continue to happen. And they all said, we're, we're, we're willing to commit. We're willing to be a uh, 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 contribute to the work of God. If you're a member here, part of being a, a member, part of the expectation of being part of our family is, is to contribute. Haggai was speaking to the same people earlier, and he says, listen, many of you are so busy taking care of your, uh, your, your own homes, so busy with your own lives, that you're neglecting the house of God. He says, no, 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 listen, you guys are doing good. You're doing great. Now, some of your energy needs to go into building up this spiritual house. You know, just because you get a raise doesn't mean you can go buy more things. Just because you get a new job and can have much more money doesn't mean you need to keep upgrading your life so that the standard of living matches. Sometimes we have to go, you know what, praise God, I, uh, he's giving me a raise. Oh, great, I can help out this spiritual house perhaps even more. Now I know that some of that is like, like that's weird. But let me go back to the original point. Once you understand mercy, it's not a situation of, man, I, do I have to? It's, I can't believe I get to worship God like this. The job I have is it's the job that God gave me. The education I've received is the education that God gave me. I know you stayed up all night in the library writing those papers. But you have to understand in the spiritual level, it's a, it's, it's a God that blessed you to even be in the position that you can be in. And because God is the one that's overall blessing our lives, we have to take a certain responsibility to give back to Him and reinvest in this church that Jesus came to build. Assume. Responsibility, collectively, financially, contributing. Now, I want to encourage the church. We, we, we had something that was going on a, a while ago. Uh, uh, we have a realtor uh, that is keeping his eye out for potential.
potential properties for us to invest in and buy so that we can actually either build or lease or own an existing church building. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be good for our DC Regional? Now, you don't have to have a building to be a church. We got that. We know that. Those of you who've been around for a while, you don't understand that. We're like a gypsy church. Back in the day, when we didn't have consistent locations, we'd be all over the place. If you weren't really tied in, you could get lost. Like, man, if we didn't have social media back then. Some of us didn't have cell phones. You just didn't know where church was. Because we understand intuitively here at DC Regional that the church is not a place. The church is not a building. The church is this chosen people that has that, that, that's been selected by God. These special people that have committed to living for Jesus Christ. We, we got that. There's no need for us to preach that point. But, wouldn't it be good to have a building? Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good to have, listen, listen, buildings around the city so that it'll be something that you can worship in and meet in, uh, sometimes often, and, and maybe uh, have classes in, some of that uh, uh, spending more and more money. So we're praying about that as a church. We think it's time. But y'all got to give to fulfill this responsibility. So there's a situation that happened. It just popped up uh, a few weeks ago. It just, hey, quick, take a look at this church. Right? Uh, the builder really called Ray. It's something, something's on the market. And this was a, uh, uh, it was in Southwest. It was a, it was like, uh, so I went to go take a look at it. It was in Southwest DC. I was like, this is perfect. This is where the city's growing. It's right near the metro. This is amazing. Oh, I want it. Uh, it's a little small. And there is zero parking. And I was like, man, everything inside of us, you know, we had some people in our team trying to figure out to how to rationalize. It don't really make a difference. But we said, yeah, it's going to make a difference. <laughs> wanted it so bad, we were faking ourselves out at one point until we came back to reality. We have a, we have a hard time getting y'all to come to a church that has ample parking. Somebody said that, it wasn't me. Carlos. So I came into the study. I drove around our parking lot. I was taking pictures, count how many spots that we would need. And then I was going into children's ministry, count all the kids. And then I'm like, ah, that one is too small for us. I didn't have a pastor's office. <laughs> I want that pastor's office. They had a baptistry. It was so, it was like, oh, come on. And then we got to say no. Then we got another call. This was, I, I, it was, it was, this, this one was awesome. Big enough for us. Ample parking for us. We scrambled. We got there. We were talking. It wasn't a south. It, this, this was not too far from where we, where we are right now. So it was a perfect. It was even closer to a metro, even though we're here. Nobody would have complained about this location because it would have been the same general location. And I know as soon as we decide, somebody going to get mad. So we understand that 30% of the church might leave, but when we get a new building anyway, we're factoring that in. We know how that goes. But this is one of those situations where we feel like everybody's going to be flying up about this, but there's an offer on it. We came and we were talking to the deacons, and there was a lady and the trustee said, man, we want you guys to have it. And we were like, we were so excited. And then we were, we, then the pastor came out. It's, it's so. Oh. That's exactly how we responded. <laughs> So I got these connections and relationships with the Christian churches, and, and I, I'm leveraging all of my friends from um, all kinds of movements, and I got all these alliances and things, and they're willing to help us financially coach us through, and just people willing to, to help us, because we, we don't have any expertise, but I got all these slew of advisors and wise people at, just right there, ready to go. We don't have enough money in the bank. 
For now. That's going to change. In 2017, when we take our special contribution up, oh, listen, we have sacrificed for world missions and we can continue to help out world missions. We're going to continue to help out our brothers and sisters in Africa, especially the ones that depend on us for an encouragement. We have bought a couple of different churches over there. We're going to continue to do that, but I'm going to call our church a sacrifice in the spring of 2017 and we're going to have a special contribution for the big Take you up. 
Pour out your blessings on this church. God, we know you can use anybody, and you are using other people. We don't think we're the only ones in this area trying to glorify your name. But Lord, we want to use, we want the privilege of you using us for your glory. Lord, use us. Our commitment to you, Father, is we're not going to neglect your work. But we're asking you to be the joy, our strength, and we're asking you to increase our, our, the, the power of our arms so that when we work a building and rebuilding, that we won't get tired or frustrated or exhausted, but renew our strength. Stir us up. Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.